So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last lecture of the practical introduction to, to quantum computing. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione. I'm the director of, of NITEX. And our speaker, like you in the last three weeks, is uh, Jan David, uh, who is a professor at, at UK Z10 of quantum computing. Yeah. Um, I'm joking, <laughs> but he will be, he will be, he will be very soon. Yeah. So again, without further ado, since uh, you already announced last week the program for today, um, you're welcome to, to share the screen and, and, and start the presentation. And just as a reminder to, to the participants, uh, we set up the mini school as a meeting. Uh, so everybody has the right to, to ask questions at, uh, at any time. Just switch it off, switch the microphone off if you're not talking and if there is lots of background noise on your, wherever you are sitting. Yeah. So Ian, please, uh, I can see you the, the screen. You're welcome to start. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, good afternoon to everyone here. Um, today is the last lecture of the mini school. And um, as promised, I'm going to be talking a little bit about quantum machine learning. And um, I think this will be a very interesting uh, lecture for um, for one main reason, and that's quantum machine learning is a, is a very new and emerging field. And unlike these examples that I've shown you in the previous lectures, you know, those were fairly old algorithms that we've, you know, we've seen and, and you know, were developed in the, in the you know, uh, at, the, at the beginning of quantum computation. But quantum machine learning is, is a sort of new field, and it's actually quite a booming field. Um, and I think I personally don't do research in, in quantum machine learning myself, but, uh, you know, just doing research in quantum computing, I already uh, made sure that I, I grasped the concepts of quantum machine learning as it is a, uh, a very, you know, big and you know, interesting field. And it can actually help you uh, with other areas of your research, uh, even if you aren't directly working in quantum machine learning, a lot of the problems that are solved in quantum machine learning, you know, are used or the ways in which we solve problems there can be used in other areas of quantum information and quantum computing. So in today's lecture, we're just going to talk a little bit about the uh, distance-based classifier with the interference circuit. And um, this is actually referred to as sometimes the smallest uh, quantum uh, classifier, binary classifier that is, and that is because it actually only requires a single Hadamard gate to perform the uh, the interference and actually classify uh, your test point. So uh, don't worry if you haven't done any machine learning before, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, a very brief um, uh, sort of intro to the problem so that I can talk to you about, um, you know, the problem that we're going to solve and how we're going to solve using a quantum computer and that in uh, with CRISCIT in Python. So uh, let me just stop my video for uh, to save some bandwidth. And when I eventually give you these notebooks, you'll you'll actually be able to go through this. And this is just a short introduction to quantum machine learning, and it gives you some uh, some references that you can look into if you're interested in, in learning more about quantum machine learning. Um, but the, the sort of summary is that we want to actually solve a, a supervised machine learning problem. And that's the problem of um, classification. So binary uh, classification of data. That is the, the, the data ha is usually a, a, a training point that has label to it. And um, you know the machine learning algorithm will actually, when given a test point without a label, will perform uh, a, some sort of computation on the data and it will actually label this new test point. Uh, given uh, the data and their labels. So that's just a very you know, uh, high level overview of what the uh, binary classification problem is. We'll formalize this in a moment or two, but the key paper that um, we're gonna be talking about in this tutorial is actually this one here, um, is called implementing a distance-based classifier with a quantum interference circuit. Um, so what we're going to do is we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the classification problem and the data set used in this paper. Um, we're gonna talk about how to pre-process the data set. Um, and then we're gonna go over the theory of the Hadamard classifier or the distance-based classifier and show how it performs the, uh, the classification. And lastly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct a quantum circuit in QuizKit that will implement this classifier 
and I'll show you how to interpret the results of the circuit and, um, and check the classification accuracy. So let's talk a little bit about the classification problem and uh, the data set that we're gonna use. So of course, um, if we consider a supervised binary pattern classification, so we can formalize this as follows. If we, if we have a data set D, and this is calligraphic D, where each element in the set is just a tuple, where the first uh, element in the tuple is a vector of, of, of data, and this is usually a normalized vector. And the second element in the tuple is a label for this vector. So um, this, this vector usually comes from Rn, and the labels are usually either just minus one or one, or you can even do zero and one, but in this case, we use minus one and one. Um, so, and we, we index the, these by M because this little M goes from uh, one to capital M. So those are the number of points in our, our um, data set. And now, if we're given some new input, which I call X tilde, this is also a, a, an n-dimensional real vector. We want to actually find what the label Y tilde is that corresponds to this test point. You know, so we refer to uh, all the points in the data set usually as training points, and the point that we don't know the label, the test point. And we're going to actually see if we can label this test point. And um, and usually we, you know, to test our our classifier, the test point. You usually we know beforehand the label, and you know we can test it by sort of checking if our classifier correctly predicts the label. And if it works well with no bias, et cetera, then we can actually use our classifier to classify points for which we don't know the label um, completely. So that's the idea of training and testing and machine learning very briefly. Um, the data set we're gonna talk about is the IRIS data set. So uh, this data set has four features. Um, and the features are the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length, and the petal width. So, um, and and there's also three different species of iris flowers, uh, which you can see here. Now, only the data belonging to the first two features and the first two species of the flowers is what we're going to be using because we only, again, want um, a binary classification problem. So we're only gonna take these first two features and we're gonna take the first two uh, classes here. So. We're basically going to do that just to take a piece of the iris data set to use in our binary classification problem. So the first thing we need to do to our data set is we need to import it. And if you have scikit-learn installed um, as a Python package, then you can already get the iris data set from scikit-learn. And I'll show you how to do that. You can import it using this data sets function. And the rest of the stuff is the same QuizKit stuff that we've been importing previously. Um, uh, this last import is just so that I can show you images of things in this notebook. Um, so that's going to be one of the prerequisites for this notebook is you're gonna to have to have scikit-learn uh, uh, installed. So um, once you have that installed, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to actually import the iris data set. And the way that I do it is you just say datasets.load iris, and then we can use uh, indexing of this list to actually extract the data that we want for from the features and also from the classes. So here you can see we've already extracted these points. We take a hundred of them, and um, this function visualize, which is written here, this actually is a function that I, that we've written to actually plot out uh, the data points on an on a on an x on x y plane, so that it's easy easier to actually visualize the data that we've gotten. So as you can see here, this is what the original data set looks like. We're plotting the sepal width, width against the sepal length. And the, the color red is one class and the color gray is another class. So we can actually see here, if we have a new test point, we actually wanna know, you know, where will it, which class will it belong to? Will it belong to either the red class or the gray class? So the first thing we need to actually do is we have to standardize uh, the data set. So by, by standardizing it, what we mean is that we have a zero mean and unit variance. And then once we standardize the data set, we also want to normalize each vector so that its length is equal to one. So how we can do that is we can actually use pre-processing from scikit-learn to scale uh, the, the data set. And what we end up with is we get something that looks like this. And this is a standardized 
uh, data set. And then we can actually normalize um, the standardized data, data set to have unit length. And we can do that with the normalized function from pre-processing. And as you can see, this is what the normalized and standardized data set will look like that we want to actually perform classification with. So now that we have our data set, we need to actually, um, we need to see what, what is from this data set, what is going to be our training points and what is going to be our test points. So um, the way in which we can go about doing this is we can just select, let's just say two or three points from either of these classes and then pick one point from the same data set to be our test point and see if we can correctly pre predict the class that it belongs to by, um, by using our distance based classifier. So the classifier that we're going to talk about today actually just implements um, the following thresholding function here. So if you do the map of the circuit that I'm going to show down here, you actually see that the class that it predicts is just going to be the signum function of this value on the inside here, the sum uh, over these, uh, the, the sort of, um, I, you could call it a distance. And if you look into the paper, they specifically state which distance function they use to actually get this uh, classification function. So the idea is we, we want to actually um, implement this classifier with the quantum circuit. So this, you know, before I even walk you through it, I'm just going to show you what the circuit looks like. This is the circuit that is going to be implementing um, the classifier for two training points. So we pick two training points in our data set, one coming from class minus one and one from class one, and with one test point. And what this is going to do is it's actually going to um, implement the, this is actually going to implement the uh, distance-based classifier for, um, for the, the specific training points that we've chosen and for the test point that we've also selected from our data set. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through step-by-step step what each um, sort of component in the circuit does and how it works. And we're gonna do that very slowly by looking at the map and, and sort of getting an intuition for how the classifier forms the classification. So the first thing we need to do, of course, is we're going to have to encode our information, our data set into a quantum computer so that we can actually use it. So we need to actually prepare our quantum states so that they have the, the, um, the training points that we selected from our data set. So the way in which we can go about doing this is we can use amplitude encoding. And this is a very common strategy in encoding information into a quantum computer. And all it does is it takes the, the input features of our normalized vector and it encodes it into the amplitudes of the quantum, of the quantum state uh, or a quantum register. If you have a, a register of two qubits, then you have a, a state vector with four basis states that you can actually encode information into those amplitudes. So what we're going to do is I'll just walk you through the procedure. So if you have a feature vector um, X, which is in dimensional, then you know, without assuming any loss of uh, generality, we can assume n to be the nth power of two. So n is some two to the n. And of course, even if n is, is, is not some power of two, um, then what you can do is you can obviously pad your vector with zero entries. And x is also chosen such that it's normalized. So um, we, we, we choose x so that it's um, this, this quantity x transpose on x is just one. Um, what amplitude encoding will do is it will actually take this vector x and it'll just encode it and it'll associate with the amplitude of the quantum state. So if I write my quantum state psi of x, we see that we, we, we cycle through, we, we sum through all the basis states and we just take then um, the entries from our vector x and we make it the amplitudes of our, of our quantum state here. And of course here i is the i of computational basis state. And if you want it in terms of your, um, your, your, your sort of like tensor product of qubits, then you will go from decimal to binary. And that's how you can find uh, the basis states here. So what we can do is we can see that the classification um, of this unlabeled test point can be performed using, let's just say two training points. So of course we pick two training points and we make sure that one is coming from class minus one and one is coming from class one. And that's because we don't want to introduce any bias into uh, our classification. So once we actually have our two training points, 
these are going to be two dimensional real vectors because of the iris data set information that we've taken. And we wanna actually prepare um, our state so that we have these points encoded into quantum states. So we can do this using the RY gate that I've shown you previously. And I've actually written here how you can actually do this. And you can say that your the encoding of the training point in a quantum state is just RY on zero. And we get this equation and we can solve for what value of theta we need to actually encode our um, our training points into the um, into the quantum state. So we can do this, and we say that if we you know if we let x tilde to be you know some training some test point and x naught and x one to be two training points that we've chosen, then we can actually encode them in quantum states as you see here. Um, so once we've actually done the um, once we've actually done the amplitude encoding, we can talk about um, what the total state of the quantum system looks like and what each register is in our circuit. Um, for more information about the points that we've chosen, you can have a look um, into the, the reference that I've cited above. We just, we're just choosing the same points that they've chosen just for completeness to replicate this using Kuskin. Okay, so in the state preparation, we have initially some state, which I call D, um, which is a, a, the quantum state and it has an index register M. It has the ancilla vectors, which will just be the zero and the one, and it'll have the test point encoding, the, um, the register that encodes the test point and the training points and a register that encodes the class of these points. So if we go up here, um, you can see A naught is the ancilla, M is the index register, I is going to be the, the, the index register that it's not the index register, the, the register that encodes these uh, training and test points. And C is going to be the class register. It's gonna encode, encode the class of each of the um, training points. So creating a state like this can be done with amplitude encoding. And I'll show you, you know, how we do that with the circuit, but using this sort of state preparation ensures that we have two copies of the test vector that are entangled with the ground state of the ancilla. And, you, and each training vector is also going to be entangled with the excited state of the ancilla. Each training vector is entangled with the unique state of the index register M or M naught. Um, and the class qubit encodes the class zero or one for each training vector. So of course, zero here is gonna correspond uh, to the, the label minus one uh, in our iris data set. So we're, we're, we're moving from minus one and one to zero and one just so that we can use our, our the, the, the notation for qubits to do this. So we wanna perform the state preparation that we sort of outlined above. And we're noting that the first qubit in our register is gonna be um, the ancilla. The, the, the second one is going to be the index register. The third one will be where we encode our training and test points. And the last one is the class qubit. So to do that using QuizKit, what we need to do is we first create a quantum register with four qubits, a classical register with four bits um, and a quantum circuit um, with both these registers in it. And then we need to actually place um, our qubits in a uniform superposition, at least for the ancilla and the index. That's what we see here. Once we've done that, we need to encode the, we need to actually encode the uh, first training point. And the way we can go about doing that is by ent by entangling it with the um, with the the sort of the one ket of the uh, ancilla, and we do it using this circuit here. So we can do that by just sort of entangling the ancilla with the register in which we store the training point, and we apply x thereafter. Then we need to encode the second training point, and we actually want to want to encode that such that it belongs to. Um, the excited state of the index uh, register, but is still sort of um, is still encoded with the um, with the ground state of the ancilla, and we do that like this. And then lastly, we will go ahead and um, and and encode the test point. Once we've done that, we need to actually store the classes of these points, and we do that with the last portion of the circuit here. Now that we've actually encoded and prepared the state D above um, the state here, what we can go and do is we can actually perform the interference. 
And the interference is the reason why this is sometimes referred to as the smallest quantum classifier. And that's because the part that does the classification is only the Hadamard gate at the top here. So all we need to do is we have the same circle from above, which is doing the encoding. And then we just apply one Hadamard gate to the ancilla. And this actually interferes um, the training in the test point, as you can see in the state D prime. And it performs, it'll help us perform the classification once we measure. So we need this interference step to actually implement our classifier. But again, it's a very easy step. We're just applying the Hadamard gate to the ancilla qubit. Once we've done that, we need to measure all of the qubits. Now that we have measured all the qubits, we're gonna get a dictionary with a whole list of counts, and we need to perform post-measurement statistics on the, these um, counts. So the final step will involve just calculating probability that the test vector is going to be in the class zero. And this probability is just going to be given by um, the probability of Y tilde being zero. It's gonna be a sum over the probability of the ancilla being in zero and the test point being in zero. And we're gonna divide that by the sum of the probability of the ancilla being in zero. And we can actually rewrite this probability in this way here using the, um, the, the absolute value or the norm between uh, the sum, the, no the norm of the sum of the test point and the training points. And we actually divide that by the, um, the, probab the, the probability um, PACC which we see here. And since every vector was actually normalized in the beginning, we actually see the probability of Y tilde being one is just one minus the probability of Y tilde uh, being zero. So of course, if the probability of Y tilde being zero is bigger than the probability of Y tilde being one, then we classify our test point as zero. Otherwise we classify the test point as uh, one. So zero, of course, corresponding to the class minus one. So let's go ahead and, and actually do the measurement in the statistics. And to do it, what we do is we, we have our circuit up until the interference step. We just measure all four qubits into the classical registers and we can execute the circuit using the, um, the air simulator, you know, the CASM simulator. And we'll get our counts list. This is what our counts dictionary looks like. And then we write a little function to actually do um, the post-measurement statistics as we've outlined above. And once we've done that, we actually get the probability of being in zero is going to be about roughly 0.63. And the probability of being in one of the ancilla qubit is going to be, or well, in the probability of Y tilde being one, sorry, is going to be roughly 0.36. Of course, because the probability of being in uh, Y tilde being zero is bigger than the probability of Y tilde being one, we've seen that the test point X tilde belongs to the class zero or has the label minus one, and this is the correct label. So our classifier is actually correctly classified um, our test point. And this is just a very brief uh, overview of how um, we can use Qiskit to implement this sort of distance-based classifier. And I should actually mention that um, in a, uh, a course that Professor Petruccione and myself, as well as with uh, Ms. S. M. Play, uh, teach at the UKZN, some students have actually done this by implementing sort of like a distance-based classifier that also implements ensemble learning and they've increased the number of training points, et cetera. And you see that um, you actually end up with um, an improved accuracy and these probabilities of uh, accuracy of classification, as well as um, these probabilities here being higher. So you have a more definitive um, answer and you don't have them sort of um, where you can see definitely that one probability is larger than the other. And they've improved this classifier that they've done as an honors project. So it's very interesting to see the work that has come out of this classifier and what you can do with a very simple circuit like this um, is, is very, very interesting. And I think that there's many, many other classifiers that have you know since been developed in the field of quantum machine learning, but um, to see that you can solve such a problem with such a simple circuit is, is something of a very interesting feat. And if you're still interested in quantum machine learning, uh, when I upload this notebook, you can actually you know, have a look at some of these references and, and you can um, uh, gain some more information and understanding about the field of quantum machine learning. Um, something very interesting was this uh, reference number eight here, this Medium article is actually written by one of the authors of the original paper 
um, on the distance-based classifier, and that is uh, Dr. Maria Schult. And it's actually a very interesting and very easy to digest explanation of the uh, distance-based classifier. Um, of course, there's no implementation of it in QuizKit, and that's why uh, you can look into this tutorial for how to implement it in QuizKit. And I think once I give you the notebook, uh, what you can do is you can actually try this out for different training and test points and, and see if uh, you can improve the classification accuracies, et cetera. So um, that's all I want to say about the distance-based classifier. Um, are there any questions at this point? Okay, if there are no questions, then I just have one more thing to talk about. And that is the fact that in this distance-based classifier, the, the, the step that does the classification is going to be um, the interference part of the circuit. So it's the step with the Hadamard gate here. But this is not the only way we can do a classification on a quantum computer. There have been many other methods uh, that implement kernels to do classification. So there's sort of, um, uh, if, you're, if you've seen these sort of hybrid algorithms where they calculate the kernel matrix on a quantum computer and then feed that kernel matrix into a classical support vector machine. There are also other schemes that actually do the quantum support vector, the support vector machine on a quantum computer, um, but those algorithms make use of, uh, of much more complicated subroutines. And another very simple way to actually perform classification on a quantum computer is is to actually use the swap test. So the swap test, which I will talk about here, just give me a second. The swap test, which I will talk about now, is another very easy way to actually um, evaluate a kernel on a quantum computer and actually perform classification. So for the most part, the swap test classifier remains the same uh, as the distance-based classifier, except at the point where the interference circuit is, you will have the swap test. Um, you can still use amplitude encoding to encode your information um, into the swap test classifier. And so that's why I'm not going to be talking about the swap test classifier in its entirety, but rather I'm just going to focus on um, the swap test and implementing it in QuizKit, just to give you an idea of how you can use this swap test to do classification. Um, Again, there are many interesting resources on the swap test classifier and its implementation, both on simulators as well as uh, real hardware. And um, I think you can find some of these references um, in, in even the, the previous notebook that I've, I've cited in there. So for the swap test, we have the usual imports that you should know by now. And we'll just talk about what it actually does. So the swap test is just procedure in quantum computing that's going to be used to compare two quantum states. And practically the absolute value squared of the overlap between the states is going to be estimated. So the swap test sort of does the following thing. Given two states psi and phi, the swap test can be used to evaluate this quantity here. So this is the absolute value squared of the inner product of psi and phi. So the first step in, 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 in the swap test will be to prepare our initial state with three registers. Um, a register that's initialized in zero and two other registers to encode the state psi and phi. And what we need to do is we'll apply a Hadamard gate to the first qubit or the first register here. And this actually yields the following state. And then we apply a controlled swap gate to such that it's controlled on the first register and it swaps the second two registers. So of course, when we do that, we see that we don't swap these two registers in, in the first term, but in the second term, we swap the two registers and then we apply a second Hadamard gate. And this is also applied again to the, um, the first register. And then we are left with the following state. And if we measure uh, sigma Z on the first qubit, so if we're, we're effectively calculating the expectation value of sigma Z on the first qubit, then what we end up with is we end up with the squared state overlap of these two states here. And you know it's easy to see how you get this. That's because the probability of measuring the state one in um, from the state here is going to be a half minus um, a half times the absolute value squared of uh, the inner product of phi and uh, of psi and phi. And in which case you can get the probability of being in zero. And the expectation value of sigma z is just the probability of this 
first qubit being in zero minus the probability at the first qubit being in the state one. And we, after we do some algebra, we see that the swap test will have implemented the squared state overlap. This is what the circuit looks like for the swap test. So um, I've, I've just walked you through all of the steps. So step zero is initializing the register. Step one, applying the first Hadamard. Step two will, will correspond to the control swap. Step three, the second Hadamard, and then we measure. So, you know, very quickly, we can talk about the, the fact that the squared state overlap, if you've read um, a very, I think it's a, not too recent, but uh, last year or so, a paper by Dr. Maria Schult, where she mentions that, um, you know, uh, I think the paper is actually called All Quantum Machine Learning Models Are Kernel Methods, and she shows how this is actually a valid quantum kernel. And so we can actually use this to do classification. Um, so that's why we have a function called the squared linear kernel, which we see here. And it just calculates the inner product of, of um, two vectors and takes the absolute value squared. Um, and we're gonna see how using the swap test circuit, we can actually, um, if we're given two vectors, compute the um, squared state overlap and then see how the swap test actually calculates that. And we show that the theoretical result matches the experimental result. So we do this using just base Python and NumPy to do it. Um, you know, just for ease of use, I have a bunch of vectors here that we can use in our circuit um, called X or Z. And um, what we do here is I've just chosen um, very simple vectors and quantum states that you might have already seen. For example, these two states here, these two vectors here just correspond to the plus and the minus states. And um, here we have a vector that corresponds to zero and we have vectors that correspond to one and then zero. So when you have the notebook, you can actually uncomment and comment the, the current ones that just play around with this uh, code to actually see how the swap test implements this squared linear kernel here. Yeah. So if we just choose X and Z to be plus and minus, we expect that their squared state overlap be zero because they're orthogonal states. So, you know, we, when we actually evaluate the function with X and zero, we get zero. We wanna actually see if we do the swap test using these two states, do we actually end up with this, the squared state overlap or the output of the swap test being zero as well? So the first thing we need to do is we need to find out if we're gonna encode our vectors into the quantum computer, we're gonna use amplitude encoding. So we need to find the angle at which um, from our vector so that we can encode it using the RY gate. And we do that using uh, this function find theta. We use the octan two function so we get the right uh, quadrant and we can find the angle um, theta that's going to go into our RY gate. And then we have a circuit for the swap test here. So the swap test circuit is going to actually um, create the quantum registers and code the, the state psi and phi, and it's going to perform the swap test and then simulate it. So we do everything in, in sort of one go so that when you actually call this function swap test, it'll just output um, for you not only the quantum state, but also the squared overlap, which is calculated here. And they calculate we calculate the squared overlap by actually simulating uh, the circuit on a state vector simulator, and then using that state vector to compute the expectation value of the observable sigma z only on the first qubit with identities on the other two qubits. And um, because of the little Eddian notation, the little Eddian notation, the observable we construct to do the expectation value and is just going to have identity, tensor identity, tensor uh, sigma z at the end. And then we just compute um, just the expectation value of this observable by taking the uh, complex conjugate transpose of the state vector that we got from our circuit um, and then multiplying that to our observable and multiplying that to the state vector uh, and yeah, just like the, the ket vector. And once we do that, we can actually run our swap test for the two vectors that we've chosen, X and Z, and it should return to us the quantum circuit so that we can draw it and the squared overlap. So if we draw the quantum circuit, this is what it actually looks like uh, with the RYs encoding the first two states here, uh, the two registers here, and the squared overlap you can see is just uh, zero that you get at the end. So of course, this is going to be a very easy, uh, you know, circuit that you can implement and play around with QuizKit, but, you know, even if you're not using it for, you know, machine learning, it's also a very useful test you can use to calculate um, just the squared state overlap of two states in a quantum computer. And this reference that you see here, reference one, uh, actually used this, this swap test to do quantum fingerprinting. So if you're interested in reading about that, 
um, you can look into reference one. And yes, that's all I would like to say about the, the swap test and, um, and how you could use it uh, in the place of the Hadamard test to actually perform classification. Of course, again, you to encode your data set, you use amplitude encoding and then you perform the swap test um, uh, in place of the Hadamard test. So I think I, I just wanna, I'll stop there um, and I'll take questions if there are any questions and yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan, for a very nice uh, explanation of a very nice uh, example. 